Welcome to Press Row. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. We've got the normal cast of characters, Todd Walker, Aaron Matthews, Mark Kuntz. I'm Matt Finkel. Guys, let's talk about the boys basketball in Lima because it has been superb to this point. Both LCC and Lima Senior undefeated. We've got a big meeting between these two schools scheduled for about two weeks from now. Will they both be undefeated when they play for the Lima Cup? And who has the best chance to trip them up? I, I say yes and nobody. So, I mean, that, <laughs> I'm, I'm not good on this question. I don't have anything to expound upon. I was going to say that Lima Central Catholic, I think, has the tougher schedule. Aaron, you could probably speak to that. Yeah, I mean, when you look at the schedules, I would say LCC schedule is the tougher of the two. Uh, starting this Friday night with state-ranked Crestview. Saturday, state-ranked Versailles. Tuesday in Dayton against Chaminade Julien, the number four team in Division Two, And then a game on Saturday night leading up to the Lima Cup, uh, but across town with Bath. That might be the easiest, per se, no disrespect to Bath and what they bring to the table, but just by looking at that stretch of games between now and two weeks from now, or however many days it is between that game, a lot of basketball still to be played. And you look at what Lima Senior has. They've got Ottawa Glandorf this Saturday night, and then they turn around Monday and play down in uh, Kettering at Flying to the Hoop against a very good Dayton Thurgood Marshall team. And then they followed up the next night with a trip to Toledo as well. Well, and then after they play St. Francis on Tuesday, they're back at home to take on Toledo St. John. So you almost have to wonder if that St. Francis game is a little bit of a trap game for Lima Senior, playing late on Monday, back up in Toledo on a Tuesday, and then they play St. John's. You know, obviously Lima Senior has gotten the Titans the last two times they've faced them, but prior to that, St. John's has kind of had Lima Senior's number, and St. John's... Lima Senior beat them earlier this year up in Toledo, but St. John's a little bit of a better team, a little bit more experienced team than they were earlier in the season. That's not going to be a gimme game for the Spartans back at home taking on St. John's either. On the flip side, as far as uh, with LCC, I don't believe that Friday night's game with Crestview or Saturday's game uh, with Versailles coming in, their lone loss is to Chaminade Julien right. on a buzzer beater uh, at Versailles over the Christmas break, and then CJ tripped them up a, two years ago down in Dayton on a shot with one second left. LCC beat them twice last year, including in the state semifinals. I mean, it's it's very hard to tell the next two weeks what's going to play out between these two programs. I think they're both will be undefeated, but uh, it's by no stretch of the imagination fate accompli. Right, and I'm, I was being a bit facetious. Yeah. Uh, no, but I've, you... I've already gone on record saying they'll both be undefeated, <laughs> so i got to stick with that. But clearly, <laughs> I think LCC has some tougher matchups between now and then. But Mark's right, the game after the flying to the hoop is clearly a game where you could have a letdown. Two straight nights with road trips of an hour plus, and St. Francis, let's face it, has been the bottom of the league, so the Spartans will be looking past them, looking to St. John's. They'll say they're not, but they will, because it's human nature. So that, that is a trap game, but Lima's got too much for the Knights. They will win that game, but it could be, by their standards, ugly. I want to throw this out there as well as after that matchup for LCC. I mean, mm -hmm. they have a Saturday night matchup with Elida, but then they go Tuesday night, Van Buren, who is state ranked in Division yep. Three, had a great game that went to overtime against Liberty Benton last Friday night here on WOSN. Shameless plug for that broadcast. <laughs> uh, watch the replay if you get the opportunity. It was a very good game. But then they also have to turn around and go to Lincoln View yes. on Friday night the 5th, homecoming for Frank Kill. And if they aren't jacked up already to begin with being number one in the state in D4, they roll the red carpet out when Frank comes back to town as uh, that 97 team is still very revered over in Middle Point. That night could be an emotional, supercharged emotional night uh, in Middle Point too. Yeah, Lincoln View, really impressed with what they're doing. Lancers are very deep. They can run the floor on you. I think that LCC Lincoln View matchup, that could be a high scoring affair. It could be very entertaining, but that's a little bit more off in the future before the, or after the lineup. Cup. Absolutely. And then for LCC, even after that, if I was looking at their schedule correctly, it doesn't get easy right up until the posting. They still have Spencerville, I believe, left on the they've schedule. Got, they've got Salina at Salina at Spencerville the last week of the regular season on Friday night, and then the very next night at Defiance. So right. birds are going to be tournament yes, ready when just based ready. on that schedule alone the last, and the last 10 games point of the year. I just wanted to make about Lima Senior is they never won a track title. So this game against St. John's, if they can beat them twice, it would pretty much put them in the driver's seat at right. least where they control their own destiny. So that is a huge game right before the game against LCC. So they'll, that's a tough stretch for the Spartans as well. All right, in the Western Buckeye League, we've got three teams tied atop the league in Defiance, Wapakoneta, and Ottawa Glendorf, all unbeaten in the league. They don't play each other, so there's a chance we can still keep this three-way tie. Will we have it after this weekend? I, I got to look at uh, Shawnee perhaps being the fly in the ointment as Shawnee takes on, I believe it's Ottawa Glendorf this week. 
Shawnee playing really good basketball right now, won what six, seven in a row. Now Defiance, Wapak, and OG will all play each other in the next three weeks coming up. But th this week they don't play each other. I, I, I think Shawnee could get uh, a victory in there. Yeah, I, I think they will all come out of it unscathed. Although I, I think uh, Bath is due to beat somebody. Uh, you know, they they, they get Wapak this week. You know, they've they've had a number of games that were woulda, coulda, shoulda. They're certainly capable of beating Wapakoneta. But I do think Defiance and OG will prevail again. And uh, I would say on my confidence scale of, of those coming through, probably uh, Wapak might be the lowest confidence. But uh, you, I think it'd be good. You don't good. think uh, Coach Davis wants to get that win over Bath a little bit extra this I'm week? I'm sure he does, but I'm, I'm sure they do too. We're going the other way. So it always makes for good fun. I, I, I like the OG Shawnee matchup of the three. I think that's the one that where there, there could be a potential slip up. Shawnee has played excellent basketball. Uh, throughout, through the most part of the year. And really, I think what has done it for Shawnee is when they make that switch, when they go to the bench and they go with that five guard lineup where their tallest player is Jaden O'Neill at six foot two, and they just run the floor, they get a free flowing offense going, and they're pretty exciting to watch when they do that. And they've been able to prove that not only can they score, but they can also play good defense when those five um, guards are on, when they go with the five guard set. And it's a combination of guys that they can go with. Um, they're pretty fun to watch. I think that could be a good game this weekend. Uh, but you've also got Ottawa Glendorf coming off an overtime loss to Finley on Saturday night up in Finley. How do they respond after going to OT, getting tested by, like they did by Finley, a game that they scored with a second left after being down as much as 10 in the first half to rally to come back and to force overtime but ultimately fall short? Well, let's not forget, I mean, Defiance, they had a hang on to beat Bath last week. So, yes. so Defiance Bulldogs, while they are undefeated in the WBL, they're, I still don't think they're as good as they were last year, which, which isn't, which, I mean, they were very good last year, obviously, state champions last year. But I, but I think Defiance is ripe for an upset as well. I don't necessarily know if home against Salina will be that upset, but I, I don't think anybody's going to come out of this league undefeated this year. No. Salina no cannot get off to a slow start like they did against OG last Friday night either. That, that game could be over quick. All right, shifting gears to the MAC now. There's five teams in the MAC unbeaten in league play so far. Who's the favorite to win the league? And coupled that with, are they the best team in the MAC? I'm not really sure who the best team in the MAC is right now. I think it remains to be seen. But do you think the best team in the league will win the league? Well, it sure looks like Versailles is the favorite to me. I mean, when you look at their body of work to this point, and, you know, I, I wouldn't be able to say definitively they're the best team in my opinion because I don't get to see them all that much. But I think right now the, the house money is on Versailles to, to win the MAC, and uh, they have been impressive to this point. Uh, CJ was their only loss, as Aaron talked about earlier, so they're pretty good. I mean, Tigers 4-0 in the MAC. I think the rest of the teams that are undefeated are only 2-0. So obviously Versailles has got a couple of games in hand. Traveling to Fort Recovery on a Friday night, I think that might be the, the test in the MAC. Whoever comes out of that game for sales for recovery, I think you have to give them the inside track to, to win the league and perhaps run the table in the league as well. I was going to mention, you know, with all due respect to Versailles, keep Fort Recovery in mind, guys, a team that has already eclipsed their win total from a year ago, arguably the most improved team in the MAC. Chris Guggenbiller took a year for his system and what he wanted to do to get implemented, to get set within the program. But I also think that part of the uh, success at Fort Recovery is those football players that won the state title this year and success breeding success, and that has been a part of what they've done. But they also had a lot of talented basketball players coming back this year. Too. Well, and don't forget, Fort Recovery baseball went to the state tournament yes. last spring as well. Yes. So they, they've had a lot of success in all seasons. With Coldwater and Marion Local also still unbeaten, but for the same reasons that Fort Recovery has played few MAC games because of football, those teams only have a couple Correct. MAC games under their belt anyway. And Coldwater did lose to Marion Local in their own tournament. Right. Not, right. But not, not in right. league not play, though. Not, not in league play, but they did fall to Marion Local, yes. All right, question now about JV basketball, and it's something we all know and love, and just hope it doesn't go to overtime most of the time. But We there, had that trending a couple weeks ago. Yeah. <laughs> there is a problem for girls basketball, though, in that they're failing to fill JV teams which just obviously will mean there won't be varsity teams in a couple of years. Is this a major concern or? Absolutely, and it's not just girls. Uh, there are a couple of boys teams around the area that play half JV games or don't play them. And it, it, this is a symptom of the epidemic going on right now at the high school level in sports participation. Many schools, in my opinion, have too many sports that they offer. They spread everything too thin. And there are too many people nowadays that say, if I'm not starting, I'm not playing. I don't want to play JV. All of these factors have been building for a number of years, and now you see some once proud programs at the small school level 
can barely field a JV team for boys basketball. I'm not even talking about girls basketball, where the problem goes back maybe a few more years. Uh, it, it's definitely a problem, and it, it could come to a head, uh, and who knows how many ways it could manifest itself. But you're right, if you don't have a JV team, how can you look forward to having a varsity team the next year? I think it's a big problem. Well, and, and you failed to mention the key word there, specialization. We keep on hearing about that, and you've got right. more and more student athletes, for whatever reason, decide they're only going to play the one sport. And for whatever reason, we're starting to see that come to a head in basketball, particularly in girls' basketball, where we're not only talking about the smaller schools not being able to field a JV team. You've got some Division II schools. Van Wert having trouble yep. fielding a JV team. Delphi St. John's, a rich history of basketball, girls' basketball success there. They're having tr troubles. Obviously, St. John's is having issues with their general population. It's not having enough kids in their school. But absolutely, it, it, it could be a major problem in a year, two years, three years. Yeah, I mean, you look at you look at those two girls programs, and those were the two that stood out to me. You know, ten years ago, Van Wert was playing for district title against Bath, and you know, Delphi St. John's has been to state. You know, have had very successful teams there. And on the boys' side, Ottoville had twelve boys. Originally, they only had ten boys, mm -hmm. and they had to scour the halls to get two more boys to come out. And they're a school that has played two quarters JV, or even said, you know, because of injuries up at the varsity level, we need this guy to dress. You know, JV. You know, they've even said, hey, we can't do a JV game tonight. And they just pushed the start time up 30 minutes for a varsity contest. It, it's sad to see when you look at the whole scale of it. And it makes you wonder, you know, with these schools, what is the long-term ramifications of this? Yeah, well, more interesting is, can we find out why? And, you know, at a lot of schools, it'll be some, for some reason, the players or the parents or the school, they don't like the coach. They don't like the coach or he's too hard on the kids. Well, you know, that's great. What are you going to do when you don't have a program? If the coach is that big a problem, you either got to get rid of him or you got to make a change somewhere else. We, you can't just have no JV games and no JV teams and just sit back and do nothing. I mean, Ottoville comes to mind. It is mind boggling to me that a proud member of the Putnam County League can't play a JV schedule. It's ridiculous. They got to get something done there. They're going to kill their program. So whatever yeah. the problem is, People got to get it figured out because it's coming to a head. And I'm not saying that it's going to run, you know, coaches like Todd Turnwald off because Todd is a very good basketball coach. But I think if you see this happen, and I'm using Todd just as an example here, you know, whether it's boys, girls, or whatever, it's going to take very good coaches and it's going to turn them off and they're going to turn their back on the game and they're going to find something else to do with their time. And it's really going to be a darn shame for the kids of those communities in which those coaches live in because they've got good teachers that could be at their disposal to teach them basketball. They're just not utilizing it because they don't have a JV program because little Johnny got his toe stepped on because the coach <laughs> told him he had to come off the bench for a game. Right. I'm hoping this trend turns around in yes. future years. Let's close quickly with the NFL. It's divisional round of the playoffs coming up this Sunday and Saturday this weekend, and there's no more Ohio teams left. So that means we start asking questions about coaches, and the Browns look like they have their guy as of this taping. It's Hugh Jackson close to agreement. Is this a good move for Cleveland? And as a side question for you, and remember we don't have a lot of time here, will Marvin Lewis be the Bengals head coach next season? I like the hire for the Browns, and Hugh Jackson has apparently said, Johnny Football, see you later. I like that move. He's establishing his authority right away. Marvin Lewis will be there till he retires. People thought he might get fired over the Bengals meltdown. They aren't paying attention. Mike Brown is nothing if not loyal to his coaches. Many of them stayed way longer than they should have uh, that were a lot worse than Marvin Lewis. He's going to be fine. Interesting part of all this is will Hugh Jackson take a run at A.J. McCarron? Obviously the Browns quarterback situation very much in flux. What A.J. McCarron was able to do the last couple of games of the season for the Bengals, Cincinnati, obviously Dalton's their guy, hmm. but all of a sudden McCarron is looks like he's somewhat valuable. Could be the Bengals, or the Bengals could part with McCarron and he'd go to Cleveland. Sure. Marvin Lewis will be the head coach as long as he wants to be the head That's coach exactly in Cleveland. Right. And Hugh Jackson is like, hey, I've been a part of one dysfunctional circus with the Raiders. Why not go be a part of another one with the Browns? But forget all that. Right now, it is all about the Chiefs, maybe, in the playoffs. Oh, here we yes, go. sir. All you right. can finally retire Just that Joe Settle Montana. down. <laughs> As Hank Stram would say, they're going to be matriculating out of the playoffs this week. We will see. Well, they look good wild card weekend. Oh, so boy. That's that. all we have to go <laughs> off right now. Thanks again, guys. Great job. As always, that does it for this week's Press Row. Enjoy your games this weekend, and we'll see you next week.